Hi, this is Francesco Nagari, Deloitte Global FRS Insurance Lead Partner. Welcome to our February 2016 IFRS 4 Phase 2 webcast. Today's webcast is titled Palo Begins for IFRS 4 Phase 2 and Deloitte Comments on the IFRS 9 Decoupling uh, Exposure Draft. The ISB moves towards completion. The agenda for today is uh, slightly different than usual. Uh, we begin uh, also um, in the usual way uh, with the highlights uh, of the ISB meeting uh, which was uh, held last week on Tuesday, 16th of February 2016. Uh, after the highlights, we'll spend uh, a good chunk of today's webcast by uh, discussing uh, uh, the ISB staff analysis, uh, the discussion of the ISB and uh, the tentative decisions that they've reached. We'll also talk about the next steps as we always do. But in addition, this, uh, uh, this time we'll also have a fourth item on our agenda, which is to cover the Deloitte uh, global comment letter on the FRS 9 decoupling exposure draft. So that's the plan for today. Let's move on to the uh, highlights. Uh, the highlights uh, of the meeting last week are clearly uh, important, uh, although there isn't uh, as much technical content to be um, presented today. Uh, it is an important milestone, nevertheless, for the uh, uh, progression of, uh, of the project towards uh, um, the publication of the new FRS on insurance contracts. Uh, on Tuesday last week, the 16th of February, the ISB has voted unanimously to begin the balloting process of the FRS 4 Phase 2. No ISB, members, uh, no ISB member intends to dissent from the publication of the new FRS, and these are clearly the best uh, uh, conditions uh, you may uh, like to see uh, if you are, like me, uh, uh, eager to see the process uh, completed uh, in the next few months. The effective date uh, and any sweep issues will be brought to the ISB for decision over the next nine months. Uh, this is similar to the process adopted uh, uh, for the other major IFRSs completed in the past two years. Uh, IFRS 9 uh, financial instruments, IFRS 15 revenue uh, for ca from customers' contracts, and IFRS 16 uh, only last month uh, leasing. IFRS 4 Phase 2 could be issued by the end of 2016 and is highly likely uh, to become IFRS 17 uh, insurance contracts, the 17th IFRS in the series. In addition, uh, Deloitte uh, uh, commented on the exposure draft uh, addressing the IFRS 9 decoupling issue on the 8th of February 2016. We favor an improved uh, deferral approach solution over the overlay approach. And the key improvements uh, are on the application of the deferral approach at below reporting entity level and on the calculation of the predominance uh, threshold. So these are the highlights. Let's now move on to the detailed discussion of the uh, ISB meeting last week. And uh, let me start by uh, recapping uh, the purpose of the meeting. Uh, the purpose was really to assess um, from the ISB perspective if all the due process steps uh, required uh, under the uh, due process handbook had been properly taken. And these steps uh, uh, include uh, the um, discussion of the matters raised uh, uh, in the exposure draft uh, uh, questions and comment letters in the course of a uh, sufficient number of public meetings. Um, it was an analysis of the documents published and the comment letters considered uh, throughout those public meetings, whether the proposals should be exposed again or not, um, the uh, assessment of any public hearings, consultative groups discussion, and reporting uh, that the SB or the chairman of the SB uh, may have uh, given to the IFRS Foundation trustees. Also, uh, if there was any field work, as this was the case for uh, uh, the insurance contracts project, uh, what was the outcome of the field work activity and also any other outreach activities completed uh, in, the, in the period uh, uh, under discussion. Now, these due process uh, steps were analyzed in a package of papers and the views that uh, the ISB staff put forward um, on, uh, on those uh, steps where the, all the required and optional steps in the ISB due process handbook have been completed with. Um, they also noted that the proposals are sufficiently developed uh, and therefore the staff 
uh, can begin the ball balloting process. Uh, they also uh, noted that uh, they expect the, the ISB to determine the effective date of the standard when the balloting process has sufficiently progressed. Uh, and finally, they consider the need for future ISB discussions of issues that may arise during the balloting process uh, as a process that uh, doesn't need uh, re-exposure and it can be done during the balloting activity. All these uh, views were expressed uh, in a much more um, uh, detailed fashion uh, through this package of papers, five papers, A, B, C, D, E. Um, the first one, background to the insurance contracts project, uh, explains uh, uh, why this project uh, has been uh, um, necessary uh, for the uh, uh, IFRS, uh, and um, what are the issues that uh, it attempts to resolve. The second paper uh, gives an overview of the new insurance contract standard, uh, based on the tentative decisions and exposure drafts uh, published to date, is a high level of review. Uh, if uh, anyone wishes to uh, have a quick understanding of uh, where is the ISB going to go with the balloting process, uh, this is a, is a good fresh paper that uh, you may want to consider for your reading. Paper 2C uh, looks at the comparison of the ISB tentative decisions uh, with the common letter summary. Now, obviously, uh, there were extensive amount of uh, comments provided to the ISB after the last uh, exposure draft uh, comment period uh, finished uh, towards the end of October 2013. And uh, one of the new processes is to explain uh, to the board what have they done in terms of tentative decisions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, recommendations that constituents provided them. Paper 2D uh, talked about the development of the requirements for the accounting for insurance contracts uh, and this was a more of a historical analysis um, summarizing the changes uh, to the accounting treatment for, for the insurance contracts uh, over the ISB previous three due process documents. And those are the discussion paper published in May 2007, the first uh, exposure draft published in July 2010, the second exposure draft uh, published in June 2013 and summarizing uh, the response to each of these documents uh, and effectively the journey that uh, has taken us to uh, last week's uh, discussion. Finally, uh, Paper 2E uh, assessed uh, the changes since the, the 2013 exposure draft, the last uh, due process document, uh, and set out uh, the very important conclusion uh, from the staff uh, as to why the ISB need not re-expose the new standard at this stage. The discussion was uh, um, an interesting one, in, in, uh, uh, in my opinion. And what I've done, I've summarized it around uh, uh, some of the themes that emerged. The, fir the first uh, uh, theme uh, is uh, the debate around uh, what type of outreach activity should the ISB undertake at this stage. The staff stated, uh, their intention to reach out to different jurisdictions on aspects of the new standard in order to ensure transparency in the drafting process, in particular, whether the uh, interpretation of the uh, English language that would be used to write the standard in the first place is understood in uh, the same way around uh, different uh, jurisdictions. Given the uh, novelty of uh, the, the set of requirements contained in the new standard, uh, this continuous validation across different markets, different jurisdictions, uh, is a very important activity, and the staff uh, stated at the outset that they intend to do so. Several ISB members were in agreement, uh, and they uh, note that there is actually a real need for ongoing communication during the drafting to ensure that uh, the final product is of the highest quality. However, some other ISB members cautioned against uh, a too wide outreach and suggested instead that the outreach to uh, a broad audience uh, should be done only on a few selective issues, combined um, with a parallel outreach to a smaller uh, targeted audience uh, on a wider range of issues. Uh, it seems that uh, this was a minority view, but we will see whether uh, one of these two uh, approaches will emerge. Certainly, uh, we will have uh, a degree of outreach activity, and that's the important message I wanted to give you. In particular, uh, the variable fee approach uh, is new, and uh, given that this will not be exposed, uh, uh, the staff suggested that they would prepare a summary paper, and they will also invite uh, comments on that. And this is similar 
to the uh, staff uh, summary papers that were published uh, uh, between uh, the first and the second exposure draft uh, when the SB reached uh, a substantial uh, body of uh, uh, tentative decisions which uh, uh, crystallized the, the requirements uh, on several uh, elements of the measurement model and therefore uh, were not planned for uh, re-exposure in the 2013 uh, draft of RS. And if you remember, particularly during 2012, several summary papers were published uh, uh, covering, uh, for example, discount rates, uh, the risk adjustment, uh, the uh, estimate of uh, cash flows, uh, uh, the premium allocation approach, and so on. Uh, we, I would expect that uh, a similar approach, perhaps uh, a more limited number of papers, given uh, where we are on the, on the process, will be published in the coming months to help us understand where the drafting uh, of the individual standard uh, is uh, evolving and allowing us to uh, contribute uh, uh, with comments uh, the refinement uh, of the wording to ensure a consistent interpretation and, and application uh, around, uh, around the world. The second theme that uh, emerged during the discussion is, um, is around uh, the, the level and type of examples in the future IFRS. The staff confirmed that it is their intention to add examples to the ones that were already drafted for the 2013 exposure draft. Some ISB members uh, took the opportunity to actually request uh, examples um, in order to reduce diversity in, uh, in a number of areas. The first one was the, the, the example on how to use the OCI solution for indirect participating contracts. The second one was uh, examples on amortization of the CSM to profit and loss over the coverage uh, period. And the third area is uh, um, the one uh, around allocation of the CSM to P&L in the case of contract lapses. All these uh, three areas were actually uh, associated with the last round of decisions uh, in January uh, 2016, which covered both the indirect participating contracts uh, and uh, the uh, uh, level of aggregation uh, around uh, the accounting for uh, uh, the contractual service margin. Uh, a, par a parallel uh, was also dro uh, drawn uh, with IFRS 15, which uh, has uh, 50 examples. And um, uh, BOM members uh, observed that uh, in the exposure draft 2013 for insurance contracts, there were only 12. Um, the staff explained that, uh, of course, they want to increase uh, the number of examples, uh, but they, um, they reminded the ISB that uh, the examples in IFRSs are designed to illustrate one point at a time, and they are not a comprehensive illustration of all the new requirements. Um, that that uh, caveat uh, was uh, leading effectively to the, the key warning that the ISB staff uh, uh, gave to the board members, which is uh, they will not uh, work uh, examples um, that could in un unintentionally create uh, uh, bright lines. And the examples of uh, uh, those contentious areas would be uh, the, uh, the presence of a principle uh, that is uh, quite clearly enunciated in the standard and which perhaps doesn't need to be exemplified. Um, the principle, for example, that the CSM is earned over the coverage period uh, uh, in line with the passage of time. Would, would uh, an example be necessary? Some board members uh, felt uh, it would be necessary, but the staff was uh, um, clear that uh, they would be uh, very careful in uh, drafting it uh, to avoid any creation of bright lines uh, in, the, uh, in the application of the standard. Other examples would be uh, the principle of uh, releasing the CSM uh, to profit and loss when there is uh, a de-recognition event. The standard uh, talks about that uh, although uh, the insurer may use a level of aggregation for that calculation, that aggregated level of uh, calculation must uh, reflect uh, the fact that uh, no CSM should be carried forward if the contract is no longer in force. So all these principles appear to have been already established and uh, there is uh, an indication as to uh, whether examples would be uh, drafted in a, in a helpful way without creating uh, an intentionally uh, bright lines. And, um, in addition, uh, other aspects that uh, will require careful drafting uh, in terms of examples include uh, the scope of the standard, the cost objective in respect to the OCI approach for indirect participating contracts, where 
you remember from our previous webcast, uh, the September and October meetings last year led uh, the ESB to abandon the prescriptive approach on uh, reporting interest expense in uh, profit and loss when uh, uh, the market fluctuations uh, would be reported uh, uh, through OCI. Um, and uh, the replacement uh, was uh, a general principle to use uh, a cost basis uh, for the presentation of the interest expense. And again, the example as to what uh, what these cost bases uh, could be and how it could be calculated uh, is something that um, we should see more of in the final standard and perhaps uh, uh, some uh, targeted uh, uh, consultation uh, in the coming nine months may be also um, uh, planned for. The level of aggregation for contract lapses and onerous contracts, similar to the uh, the points I was uh, discussing just a moment ago, and also the uh, application of the principle of uh, accounting for discretion in the uh, um, approach to indirect participating contracts uh, as approved uh, uh, in the uh, board meeting last January. Uh, one ISB member also stated that uh, further consideration was required requi re regarding presentation and disclosure. Examples uh, he noted uh, were the scope of the variable fee approach, where we got the the famous three criteria to be explained, uh, what is meant by a market return, and again, this links back to the uh, accounting for uh, indirect participating contracts, where there is this market return reference. Uh, examples on the presentation and disclosure of the allocation of the CSM and the expected future profitability of insurance contracts. Uh, there was discussion also about uh, the possibility uh, to road test these examples um, with selected constituents, and it was eventually agreed that uh, road testing will be done, but not uh, on the model itself, of course. Uh, that model is now decided, but it would be effectively um, a quality control uh, road testing uh, around uh, the wording that uh, will be used uh, in the drafting of the examples so that uh, there is no uh, ambiguity uh, on the way those examples are used uh, um, to guide uh, the application of the principles. Uh, in the in the new FRS, the third theme I wanted to uh, uh, report back to you is on uh, on the final comments that uh, uh, were made before the vote on balloting. One ISB member uh, proposed that uh, this should not be uh, a reference to the OCI solution being uh, the preferred approach for presenting uh, uh, the time value of money, um, and the the chairman uh, Hans Ogerwurst actually expressed uh, personal sympathy for, for this view and actually taken, took the uh, executive decision of instructing the staff to, uh, to have their point redrafted so that there is no uh, preference for one or the other. In fact, he expressed his personal preference. Uh, in fact, I hope, uh, I should say, that uh, uh, when insurers uh, adopt the new standard, uh, the majority will be uh, reporting uh, the impact of discount rates uh, in profit or loss. We will see if... Uh, uh, the chairman of the SB will have uh, his uh, hopes uh, fulfilled or not. Uh, the chairman also uh, made another personal comment, uh, and that was a comment on the variable fee approach, where he shared the fact that uh, um, he is not personally fully comfortable with it. Uh, uh, he believes that uh, there is a, a degree of uh, real economic volatility that is not coming across in the financial statements as a result of the variable fee approach. But uh, made it clear that uh, he has uh, accepted it, uh, and it was not an attempt to reopen the debate at all. It was just a final comment, um, and uh, he accepts it uh, as a clear, necessary step in order to uh, finalize uh, the project. Um, several of the ISB members uh, then took the opportunity to thank the staff for their efforts to date and wish them uh, to continue with their hard work uh, drafting the finance text of the, of the new FRS. And of course, the staff assure them uh, that they will do so and that uh, they will also keep uh, the constituents uh, as up to date as possible on their progress by means of summary papers, like the one I was uh, referring to earlier on the variable fee approach, and also targeted consultations, uh, whether it's going to be on a, on a few items uh, for everyone to see, uh, more summary papers, in other words, or perhaps uh, more privately, uh, with a small circle of, uh, of experts that uh, may be consulted on a regular basis on a wider uh, range of topics. We shall see. But something will happen for sure. So then uh, the vote came, and as you know already, uh, it was a unanimous approval. 
of the fact that uh, the ISB is now satisfied that all the mandatory due process steps have been met on the project uh, and uh, um, the permission to begin the balloting process uh, for a new FRS insurance contracts uh, uh, should be granted. Also, uh, none of the ISB members intend at this time to dissent from the new FRS on insurance contracts. Uh, and at that point, uh, there was a standing ovation and a big round of applause uh, to everyone involved uh, in the project, which was in the room, board members and staff and so on, uh, which was a nice, uh, nice thing that uh, uh, I thought that uh, you should also know um, happened last week. In terms of the next steps, uh, uh, we are now uh, in the phase of the project uh, uh, that uh, is producing the final text, the balloting process, um, and uh, there are a few remaining steps uh, that uh, will effectively uh, making up the, uh, the balloting process, including uh, the uh, decision on uh, what mandatory effective dates should be included in the final text of the standard. Uh, these will be uh, raised as a matter for the board to decide and vote for uh, when the drafting uh, has sufficiently progressed. Uh, there will be some drafting quality assurance procedures, like the, one, the ones that we discussed earlier and for a, a degree of external review, and the preparation of documents uh, such, such as the effects analysis that would accompany uh, the new standards, similar things to the ones that uh, you have read in the 2013 exposure draft. The staff will also consider the need for future ISB discussion of issues that may arise during the balloting process, and these will be tabled as sweep issues. Now, having said all that, uh, um, there we comes with the uh, um, statements from a Deloitte perspective. We believe that the choice of the effective dates, uh, given all things uh, we heard uh, last week, uh, uh, is still uh, um, likely to be the 1st of January 2020 uh, if the target publication date is achieved and uh, the odds, in our opinion, are in favor of that target being met, but uh, uh, we'll see. Um, we are certainly now in the, uh, in the final mile of this process uh, and uh, um, the evolution over the next few months uh, will tell us more and we will continue to update you on how this uh, balloting process uh, uh, moves on. That is the last uh, uh, of my comments on, uh, on last week's meeting. So let me now uh, begin now the second part of the webcast today uh, and discuss the content of the Deloitte Global Comment Letter to the ISB on the uh, exposure draft uh, um, that uh, proposes uh, some temporary solutions uh, on the application of FRS 9 uh, with FRS 4. Uh, the, fee the first and most important uh, uh, point that we made in our comment letter is that we agree that there are valid reasons to introduce a temporary solution to the IFRS 9 decoupling issue, as we've been calling it in, uh, in these webcasts. The deferral approach, if modified uh, along the lines that we recommended in our comment letter, uh, is likely to prove a more effective solution than the overlay approach. The latter should be retained only if constituents demand it. Uh, the predominance test uh, should be permitted at the reporting entity level or at lower levels below the parent entity. That's one of the key um, ways of uh, improving the deferral approach. And there are improvements uh, also that we think could be uh, introduced uh, uh, to the predominance test calculation, uh, and those improvements are easily adopted. We also stated uh, in our comment letter that uh, we are in agreement the 1st of January 2021 is an appropriate sunset clause for these temporary solutions, for the deferral approach in particular. Now, let me run through the six questions that were included in the exposure draft and for each uh, to uh, explain to you the position that we have taken. First one, um, addressing the concerns raised. Uh, do we agree that the uh, ISB should seek to address these concerns? And the answer is, uh, is a resounding yes. Uh, we have been proponents as a firm uh, to uh, identify solutions to the decoupling of the effective dates of IFRS 9 and IFRS 4 Phase 2, and uh, we believe that all the reasons that the ISB has identified in this project draft are valid uh, to introduce such a temporary solution. Then moving on question two, um, proposing both an overlay approach and a temporary exemption or deferral approach from applying IFRS 9. Should both uh, approaches uh, 
be present in the final text uh, that will amend Alpharas 4? Well, the answer was uh, uh, yes, we believe that uh, there is nothing uh, harming the retention of, uh, of two methods. However, uh, we believe that uh, one of the two methods, the deferral approach, is likely to prove a more effective solution than the overlay approach. But this uh, solution, the, over the uh, deferral approach, should be improved by uh, effectively allowing uh, the deferral approach test to be applied below report entity uh, level. And, uh, and therefore, we do not support the all or nothing approach that um, the, the ISB has proposed uh, for the deferral approach in the exposure draft. The, def the overlay approach should be retained uh, if constituents demand it. Uh, if uh, the deferral approach is uh, improved as we recommend uh, the ISB uh, should do, then it may prove to be uh, redundant. When we look at uh, question three, uh, we contributed, uh, uh, despite what we said in question two, to the uh, overlay approach refinement. And uh, the three recommendations uh, that we uh, suggested um, for the overlay approach uh, is to improve it uh, in the uh, section where the requirement for the asset uh, dependency um, is established. That is the condition for the designation of an asset uh, to generate the overlay adjustment. We suggest that uh, a basic uh, definition of what that dependency uh, is uh, would help. In particular, we suggest that there should be some basic uh, documented policies that can be audited, uh, for example, uh, for the designation to be possible. The second uh, um, uh, point is uh, that given that there are uh, both fair value gains and fair value losses uh, arising from the adoption of FRS 9, which would then be reversed by the overlay adjustment, uh, we uh, suggest that the presentation of the overlay approach should be a requirement to have two separate lines, one for investment income and one for investment expense in the profit and loss account, uh, and a single line uh, in the uh, other comprehensive income that will enhance greatly the comparability of those entities. And we believe at this point that there will only be a few of them uh, that may adopt the overlay approach. Finally, we also recommend some clear requirements for the reclassification of amounts presented in OCI uh, following the uh, uh, interruption of the use of the overlay approach on a voluntary basis or the uh, loss of, uh, of the uh, right to use it uh, because uh, the relationship between the financial assets and the FRS4 contracts uh, and no longer uh, exists. On question four, uh, regarding the temporary exemption, uh, this is where we had uh, the most extensive response. Uh, first of all, because uh, we explained that uh, although we agree that the predominance criterion based on the carrying amount of liabilities is the appropriate test, uh, uh, we also highlight that there are some uh, refinements uh, necessary to make it uh, applied, applicable to uh, an appropriate uh, universe of uh, relevant uh, financial assets. And the only way to do that is to allow this deferral approach to be applicable below reporting entity. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we need to uh, um, accept, and that's what we recommend to the ISB, we need to accept uh, uh, a temporary uh, regime where financial assets will, uh, will be accounted for using non-uniform accounting policies. Uh, given that this is a, a temporary uh, exception to the uh, principle of consistency accounting, uh, and given that uh, there are, uh, in our opinion, uh, pos possible suitable disclosures to enhance uh, uh, the relevant transparency of, uh, of those uh, different uh, accounting treatments, uh, we think that this is an acceptable uh, approach to, uh, um, to accounting for financial assets. We also uh, ex explained in our response to this question that uh, the application of the predominance test uh, um, should be effectively applied uh, using uh, what we call a waterfall approach. And this idea of uh, the below reporting entity level uh, is uh, executed effectively by uh, testing the uh, predominance test uh, as proposed uh, at the top of a reporting entity uh, group. Uh, but unlike the ISB, which says uh, uh, if you don't pass it then, then you cannot uh, apply the deferral approach, we say, no, actually, you should allow that entity to move one level down and then uh, uh, continue to move down until you get to the level of subsidiary, potentially, 
and uh, the outcome of that uh, exercise should then be preserved when those uh, elements of the group are brought back together into the same uh, overall set of uh, consolidated financial statements. Now, this uh, clearly introduces uh, uh, the two accounting system, an IS39 system and an IFRS9 system within the same reporting entity. So we need to explain how Deloitte uh, views the transfers of assets between those two subsets uh, of the same reporting entity. And what we see, what we see here is uh, the introduction of a one-way system approach. So if uh, there is a, a subset of the group that uh, uh, ends up using IFRS 9, those assets will remain accounted for under IFRS 9, even if they move into the portion of the group that uh, has uh, elected uh, under the condition uh, to use the referral approach to uh, not apply IFRS 9. However, if you are transferring and selling an asset from the portion of the group that is uh, using IFRS 39 to the portion of the group that is using IFRS 9, then the change in accounting uh, takes place. And uh, we are recommending that uh, if you are moving the asset uh, to the IFRS 9 part of the group uh, and that uh, receiving party uh, or receiving a portion of the group, the, the buying uh, portion of the group, uh, classifies the um, financial assets to be measured at Fevatri PNL or Fevatri OCI, then the um, uh, cumulative change in value should be recognized in profit or loss or OCI. Whilst if the, um, uh, the buying part of the, uh, of the group, uh, the one that uses IFRS 9, accounts for the financial assets at amortized cost, then the carrying value uh, from the IS39 uh, portion of the group should be used uh, and it should be the initial measurement uh, uh, value uh, under FRS 9. That will allow us uh, to effectively maintain uh, a logical continuation of uh, amortized cost uh, um, into the FRS 9 uh, uh, regime. We will also recommend uh, disclosures um, uh, for these internal transfers, uh, uh, focus on the total amounts of assets uh, sold, as well as the relevant gains and losses uh, being uh, reported and these should be required disclosures in the uh, financial statements of uh, any reporting entity that has been using the deferral approach. We also um, noted uh, in our response to, uh, to this question that uh, there is a balance uh, uh, between the simplicity that the ISB wanted to achieve in the calculation uh, of the predominance test uh, and uh, uh, how faithful the outcome is of that test. Uh, and uh, we are of the view that uh, although maintaining the level of simplicity, uh, the calculation can effectively be improved. And um, in particular, we suggest that the improvements uh, are designed around uh, uh, refinement of that calculation that uh, allows it uh, to uh, identify a predominantly insurance activity uh, business um, when uh, certain other features uh, may be present um, in the in the same reporting entity. Uh, examples of those features that uh, may, uh, if not dealt with, uh, distort the outcome would be the, uh, the funding structure of that business. Now, uh, financial liabilities uh, could be the vehicle that uh, a business may have chosen to raise capital uh, for the same uh, in predominantly insurance activity, but because they are financial liabilities, they would uh, dilute the um, the proportion of IFRS 4 liabilities uh, against the total, uh, and that dilution would not take place if the same uh, predominant uh, insurance activity business had been funded by uh, equity, for instance. So the uh, removal of those uh, funding uh, liabilities uh, is an example of uh, the refinement we were thinking. Another example is uh, the removal, again, from the denominator of the ratio of those liabilities that are um, associated with contracts linked uh, uh, to segregated funds that are financial liabilities measure at Fevato PNL under IS39 and are likely to continue to be so measured under IFRS 9. The last two questions, uh, uh, very, uh, very quickly. On question five, uh, uh, should the overlay approach and the deferral approach uh, be optional? Yes, we believe that the SB is right in making them optional. We don't think uh, that uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, a, a good idea to uh, make this uh, uh, or one of the two uh, a requirement for everyone to qualify uh, that qualifies under a particular condition. Uh, we believe that optionality is the right answer 
uh, because uh, there could be uh, different situations given that uh, IFRS uh, uh, 4 allows such a diversity of accounting policies and uh, it's uh, difficult to predict whether uh, one way or the other uh, would be a, a universal uh, conclusion uh, in the assessment uh, of uh, the impact that IFRS 9 will have on each uh, insurance uh, entity around the world. The same conclusion uh, in favor of uh, the proposal um, was our response to question six uh, uh, regarding the uh, sunset clause for the deferral approach. We believe that the 1st of January 2021 is an appropriate uh, choice. Uh, what we also uh, took the opportunity to uh, strongly recommend that the ISB concludes, as they did last week, uh, its deliberations uh, on the new insurance contract standard uh, in a way that uh, it will allow it, uh, uh, it will allow it to um, to choose an effective date that is within the timeline set uh, by the uh, deferral approach. Uh, so that means that uh, uh, the first of January 2020, for example, as we predict at the moment, uh, is going to be the the more likely than not uh, choice, uh, would be a good outcome uh, along the lines that uh, we recommended. But also the first of January 2021 could be an equally uh, good outcome because it was still be within the period uh, during which the deferral approach uh, is effective. And that is the last uh, uh, point uh, on the common letter that Deloitte uh, published uh, uh, two weeks ago that I wanted to, uh, to share with you. Um, let me just take you to the last uh, slide of today's webcast uh, um, and uh, remind you that uh, uh, the webcast will be uploaded in, uh, in our uh, dedicated website, Deloitte.com forward slash I2II, as well as our YouTube channel. And you can follow us uh, on uh, uh, the various social media channels uh, advertised uh, on, these, uh, on this page. Now, this is the time uh, for me to uh, stop the recording and to invite you uh, to submit your questions.